For half a century, one of the world's most fantastic fortunes was believed lost, its priceless heirlooms from the land of the Homeric legends, a casualty of war. But when the cache was discovered in the secret vault of a museum in Russia, an international uproar ensued. Governments from around the world laid claim to what is undoubtedly the most controversial treasure known to man, gold mined from the ancient city of Troy. During the spring of 1991, two Russian art students quietly sifted through government documents behind closed doors in Moscow. For years, they had been searching for leads to one of the greatest mysteries of the 20th century. What treasures did the Russian army smuggle out of Germany during the final days of the Second World War? The Russians had always vehemently denied that they stole anything. Instead, they said, the riches hoarded by the Nazis were destroyed during the Allied invasion of Berlin. But the art students believed otherwise. They grew up hearing whispered rumors of secret vaults filled with fantastic fortunes of war. Throughout the 1980s, they had searched government records, finding few clues to the treasures. Then, in a hushed hallway of the Pushkin Museum, everything changed. Just after dawn, a cleaning crew prepared to dump some trash, unaware of the sensational secrets of treasure they had in their hands. They had a very lucky find about some of the looted art because um, somebody was throwing out some old documents and papers from the Pushkin Museum. And one of these young curators was passing by because he had previously worked there. And he said, shall I help you with this rubbish? And his eye lit upon some documents. It was exactly like a, like a detective story. And he realized that there must be a lot of stuff in the Pushkin Museum. Some very special records were about to be destroyed. The well-preserved details of the Russian war machine's plunder. The documents, along with others found soon after, were a blueprint to a king's ransom. The papers detailed how as Russian troops moved across Eastern Europe towards Berlin, priceless paintings, sculptures, and stacks of silver were smuggled aboard planes bound for Moscow. After all the years, evidence had been found that damned the Russian army for its spoils of war. Included among the items were three remarkable crates all filled with gold worth untold millions of dollars. It was the 1873 treasure of famed archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann, a treasure from the lost city of Troy, a treasure known around the world as Schliemann's gold. For 50 years, the world believed the priceless gold pieces had been destroyed during World War II. The Russian government would soon be forced to confess that it had been hiding one of the greatest treasures on Earth. But Schliemann's gold had less controversial origins. It was forged somewhere between two and 5,000 years ago in the desolate hills of northwest Turkey. It was a time ruled by gods and goddesses a time when soldiers fought one of the greatest battles of the ancient world, the Trojan War. The fabled city was made famous by the Greek poet Homer. He wrote about its denizens, Hercules, Achilles, and Helen, the most beautiful woman the world had ever known. Schliemann believed his golden treasure was proof of Troy's existence. 
We simply don't know who these people are because we don't have one of the missing clues, and that is any written materials. We have the archaeological evidence, but that does not describe the people. We can say something about the type of people, however, from the settlements, from the archaeological material. Almost immediately, they fortified the site. Throughout Troy's history, seven different civilizations lived in the area over the course of 3,000 years. During its later years, about 1000 BC, Troy was a thriving capital of commerce and production. Troy was probably one of the major centers of jewelry production during just this period of time. And with its strategic location, remember the Dardanelles leading into the Black Sea, land routes into Anatolia, access by the Aegean across the Aegean westward, southward into the, the southeastern Mediterranean. Troy was not a backwater, a citadel for a chieftain, but it was a lower, very vibrant city of production. It was sometime during Troy's jewelry-making heyday that some of the most remarkable gold pieces from the ancient world were made, a treasure that more than 2,000 years later would be known as Schliemann's gold. Why jewelry? We don't know their motives unless they write them down in, in some kind of way that we can read about them. Ah, that beautiful sapphire, or those wonderful gold earrings. I think we can speculate, and probably the archaeological material would confirm this, that the motives are very much the same as, as modern motives. If we look at the treasure, it's beautiful. Who could not love this? It was a painstaking, labor-intensive process to create the jewelry that was unearthed by Schliemann. Raw materials were mined up to several hundred miles away. Artisans worked for months to create just one piece. The craftsmanship of this piece is astounding. It consists, all in all, of 15,000 elements, and just to prepare the inlay of the chains, it required 80 meters of gold wire. Though heavy and large, there is evidence that this diadem was meant to be worn, made for a living woman, possibly a priestess or a queen. Schliemann believed the queen who wore such a piece was the beautiful Helen of Troy, daughter of Zeus. She was said to possess such beauty that men would become mesmerized when they gazed upon her. The kidnapping of Helen by the Greeks led to 10 years of fighting, a conflict known as the Trojan War. It was during this time that a king named Priam ruled Troy. It was believed that Priam had created a vast fortune of gold much of which was lost when Troy was burned to the ground. 2,000 years would pass before any clue would be found to explain what happened to the gold. It would take the passion of the brash adventurer Heinrich Schliemann to unearth a treasure magnificent enough to be called Priam's gold. His only map, the magical writings of a Greek poet named Homer. Before there was Indiana Jones, there was Heinrich Schliemann. The German-born adventurer is known as the first modern archaeologist. The colorful Schliemann earned his larger-than-life reputation in 1870, when he set off to prove that the Homeric legends were based in truth and not the imagination of the Greek poet Homer. In the hills of northwestern Turkey, Schliemann staked his claim. He believed somewhere beneath the soil was physical evidence proving the existence of the city of Troy. The scientific community said he was crazy. Even those who thought Troy could have existed said Schliemann was in the wrong place. But the 46-year-old Schliemann was not swayed. He was obsessed with Greek history. It was a passion that had fueled his imagination since he was a boy. He was born in northern Germany, 
and his father was a pastor and involved with many scandals. And came a moment when Heinrich Schliemann was about 14 when his father got sacked from his job. And Schliemann, who had been having some sort of education, was then sent as an apprentice to a grocer's in Mecklenburg. And there, he later would say, he would have remained all his life had it not been for a school teacher who came into the shop one day and recited Homer. And at this, the young Schliemann became absolutely enchanted by the sort of spectacle of the lost world and began to think about the Greeks and about the ancient times. Schliemann became voracious for knowledge. In his lifetime, he would master 22 languages. He said he could learn a language in six weeks simply by reciting words over and over again. During his early 20s, he went to work as a bookkeeper for a large German trading firm. Schliemann was sent to Russia, where he married a local girl. But he was unhappy and the marriage ended when Schliemann began to travel the world. He made a fortune from his business dealings and from investments during the California gold rush. He became a United States citizen and soon set off in search of fame and fortune. Schliemann was ready to pursue his life's dream to trace the roots of the ancients, both in his work and his personal life. By now, he was obsessed by Greece, and he felt he needed a Trojan bride. So he asked a friend of his to find him a suitable girl in Greece, because he needed a Greek girl. So this friend wrote back with several pictures, and, and one of them was a picture of 16-year-old Sophia. And at first, he thought, this is ridiculous. There was 32 years between them. And then after a bit, he fell in love with the picture, and he set out various tests by letter to see if she could recite Homer and, and what she knew and so on. And then he went, in fact, to Athens, and he met her, and he listened to her recite, and he thought she would be the perfect bride for him. I mean, he had found his Helen, his Helen of Troy. At first, she resisted, but her family talked her into the marriage. Schliemann had money. They had two children, Andromache and Agamemnon, named after heroes in Homer's The Iliad. With his Greek family in place, Schliemann set his sights on his greatest goal, prove the existence of Troy through archaeology. He knew not only classical Greek, but modern Greek. His second wife was a young Greek woman. Their children were named after the Homeric heroes. And I think he wanted to show that this bore some resemblance to historical reality and was not simply a myth. With his interests, with his love of, of, of Homer and the Trojan War, um, and his money, Schliemann was able to put this to a test. Schliemann went to northwest Turkey in 1870, where he believed he could find the ruins of the lost city. He used the Iliad to plot his course. Schliemann only had one guide. He didn't take time to read other things. He simply read Homer, and particularly the Iliad, which tells the story of, of Troy. It's full of sentences leading one past rivers, alongside mountains, um, and if you follow them to the letter, you do reach a spot. Now, there was a spot on the plains of Troy called Hisalik, which was a mound. And standing, surveying the scene, he said, that is where Troy lies. Though Schliemann had amassed a considerable fortune, financing an archaeological expedition in a foreign country still proved to be a daunting task. He hired a slew of local men to work with him and proceeded to do something he had never done before, oversee an archaeological dig. He ran into all sorts of problems. He was maddened that the Christian Greeks wanted to take Sundays off, so he would bring in Muslim Turks to work where the Greeks had holidays. He got everybody up very early, so the dig started at about five o'clock. There was a, a break at mid-morning, which was then about 9.30, and then they would have something to eat, and then they would dig again, virtually for the rest of the day till sundown. These people worked tremendously hard. 
It was as if the gods were against him. Schliemann ran into problem after problem. Illness ran rampant in the camp. Malaria was a common problem because of swarming mosquitoes. Food and water had to be shipped in from hundreds of miles away. Schliemann was a taskmaster. He refused to let his workers smoke tobacco because he felt it drained their strength. 12-hour days in blazing heat were common. At night, the howling of foxes and the hooting of owls drove everyone crazy. Eventually, it became so bad that Schliemann had one of his men shoot the owls because he couldn't stand the noise any longer. On top of everything else, the Turkish government was wary of a foreigner foraging through their land. The dig was heavily scrutinized by an observer whose watchful gaze put Schliemann's quest in jeopardy. To make matters worse, Schliemann had to learn everything by trial and error. Because Schliemann was not a scholar, and because he was in a tremendous hurry, he didn't do his digging very carefully. He had brought a number of tools, some of them from England, like spades, which were better in England. But otherwise, he used baskets to carry the bricks away. He used oxen. But it was chaotic. He had sometimes as many as 120 workmen on the site, and he had an overseer. But from hour to hour, there would be accidents. And other archaeologists who sort of unpicked their digs stone by stone were appalled because his methods were so crude. But Schliemann did keep a meticulous diary of what he found. Archaeology was in its infancy. And he, well, he did want to get to the earliest site and went straight down to the bottom. He did detail every single thing that he found on his way down, digging from top to bottom, and published immediately. After three years of working at a furious pace, Schliemann pushed his men even harder. Each artifact recovered at the site was proof that Schliemann was getting close to King Priam's Troy. Then, on a hot, dusty morning in mid-June 1873, Schliemann was checking a newly dug trench when a flash of light caught his attention. There was something glimmering in the dirt. After three years of exhaustive searching in the barren lands of northwestern Turkey, Heinrich Schliemann could not believe what he had found. The lost treasure of Troy was finally within his grasp. A glimmer of gold shone from the dirt. It was the moment of a lifetime, one that Schliemann knew he had to keep quiet. His original version was that digging one morning alongside his workmen at about 9.30, just before break time, he uncovered a bit of copper and a bit of gold. So he knew he was being watched by the Turks, who didn't want him to take anything out of Turkey. So he shouted out, break, let's all have an early break, it's a very hot day. And the workmen all downed tools and went away, leaving him with Sophia. Schliemann and his wife gathered all the items they could carry. A copper shield, a cauldron, a silver vase, a copper plate, several cups, and a silver knife. The couple quickly placed the items inside Sophia's shawl and hurried to their tent. It was then that he realized that he had indeed struck gold, because apart from the cups, when he looked inside the vase, he found there was this incredible jewelry. There were diadems, there were earrings, there were rings, there were bracelets. And it, the amount of gold was extraordinary. It was quite beyond anything he had ever imagined. Again and again, the Schliemanns smuggled to their tent all the treasure they could carry. The gold of the ancients poured from the ground into their hands. For the next hour, the couple embraced their bounty. Schliemann would later describe the moment as one of the most magical in his life. The visions of his youth, his lifelong dream of proving the existence of Troy, had come true. Schliemann and his wife stayed inside, saying they needed a break from the heat. But the ruse didn't work. 
The Turkish overseer was told that Schliemann had rushed to his tent and had not come out. The Turk demanded to search Schliemann's tent, but he was refused. When the official left to get the police, Schliemann made a split-second decision. The only way to save the gold was to smuggle it out of Turkey. Before the official could return, Schliemann packed the gold and took it to a nearby port. From there, it was shipped to the home of his wife's parents in Athens. Schliemann's excitement must have been absolutely unbelievable because here he was, this untrained scholar who archaeologists despised, who had no reputation in the world, who was longing for sort of prestige and titles and honors, had been the person to uncover this incredible wealth, this cache of gold. And he was, of course, helped in his excitement by the fact that he personally had no doubts at all that this was the final proof that he had discovered Troy. Now, at the same time, he, like all archaeologists of his day, had extreme contempt for the countries in which they were digging because they did not think that they were sort of worthy custodians of, of the past. They believed it ought to be in European hands. So he had no compunction at all about smuggling it out of Turkey. I mean, it was just a question of how to get it out without being stopped. Unbelievably, for the next six months, Schliemann managed to avoid detection while digging in the remote section of the site. Small crates filled with treasures thousands of years old were shipped one by one out of Turkey to Greece. When all the treasure was safely in Athens, Schliemann followed. It was only then that he was able to carefully examine the treasure for the first time. He was amazed. It covered the gamut of Trojan society. Some of it is really quite simple and could be afforded, if we use that kind of word, by people who are not particularly wealthy. Hair rings, for example, um, coils that are used for earrings. But some of it is hugely elaborate and uh, would be an object of, of much admiration amongst the, the majority of people. And it wasn't just jewelry that Schliemann pulled from the ground but ornamental tools as well. Polished lapis lazuli axes, which most likely hung on the walls of the wealthy leaders of Troy, were also discovered. As Schliemann surveyed the incredible treasure trove, he pulled from the pile of artifacts a single item, one that marked the fulfillment of his dream. Among the items in the treasure was this incredible diadem with all these different pieces, virtually intact. And Schliemann was absolutely certain, and nobody could ever have persuaded him otherwise, that it belonged to Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in the world. And because he was married to this beautiful Greek girl, he somehow merged them in his mind, and he dressed her up in, in this diadem and in the, in the gold. And there are these very famous pictures of her wearing these wonderful gold things. And he sort of imagined her to be Helen. So he lived, in a way, the myth of the past through his own family and through what was happening to him. Schliemann could not contain himself. He announced to the world, through letters to noted archaeologists, that he had found Troy, and the treasure was his proof. His claim was met with skepticism from the academic community and outrage from the Turks. They said Schliemann had pillaged their land and forbade him from re-entering the country. The Greeks, however, were delighted believing the gold would stay in their country. Schliemann had gotten what he wanted. He was famous, he believed he had proved the existence of Troy, and everyone wanted his gold. At once, there was a sort of feeling about where is he going to send it. And he played everybody off for a bit. For a while, he thought he might give it to the British Museum in London, because they might give him some honors, but no honors seemed to be forthcoming. And in 1880, he settled on Berlin um, because the Germans promised him medals and honors. So he formally gave it to Germany, to, to, to Berlin, in tremendous ceremonies, and he met the Kaiser, and everything was extremely exciting, and, and just as he wanted it. The Germans set up a display for the treasure. People came from all over the world to see what was being called Schliemann's gold. 
Regardless of what scholars thought of Schliemann's methods, once they examined his treasure, gold pieces forged at the dawn of man, they had to admit it was an amazing, priceless find. It pushes the human past in this part of the world back incredibly far. And it does so in a really very glorious kind of way. These are not people, you know, small bands of people who are moving about constantly. These are people who are beginning to build a unique culture. Though the controversy still raged over Schliemann smuggling the treasure out of Turkey, the hubbub died down when he paid the Turks 2,000 pounds, a huge sum at that time, to make amends. In 1876, Schliemann was allowed back into Turkey to do more excavating, this time with even tighter restrictions. He went on to find Mycenae, the place from which the Greeks launched their ships against Troy during the Trojan War. But nothing he found in other digs ever equaled what he discovered on that hot morning in 1873. By 1890, Schliemann was going deaf. He underwent exploratory surgery on his right ear, and an infection set in. He died a few weeks later at the age of 68. He was buried in his beloved Greece, in this mausoleum, with full state honors. His wife, Sophia, continued her husband's work. She personally supervised digs in Turkey and Greece. Along with her children, Sophia Schliemann worked for the rest of her life to keep her husband's name at the forefront of the expanding field of archaeology. Schliemann had gone to his grave believing that Troy's gold would be forever on display at the Berlin Museum. A half century later, the Second World War would prove him wrong. As Allied troops marched through Germany toward Berlin at the end of World War II, the curator of the city's museum scrambled to save the treasures of the state. The Germans had built several nearly bomb-proof shelters throughout Berlin once the war had gone bad, and now priceless artworks, including Schliemann's gold, were being hidden away. Three crates marked Troy, were taken to an out-of-the-way place the Germans thought the Allies would not bomb, a bunker in the middle of the Berlin Zoo. It would not remain hidden for long. Allied troops were making their way door to door through the city. Plundered Nazi treasure was easy pickings. The Russians had long been aware of the priceless objects the Nazis had amassed during the war. They now had orders to seize everything they could find. The Russians say as the bombs rained down, the aging curator of the Berlin Museum did the only thing he could to save the treasures. He went to the first army he could find, the Russians, and gave it to them for safekeeping. The building where the collection was stored was already half destroyed, and he was afraid that the collection would be damaged or would be simply lost, or the SS men would blow it up. And so, he writes in his diary, that he invited the representative of the Soviet military administration and handed them these crates. The Germans tell a much different story. They say the treasure was stolen, looted by Russian marauders. All the Allies uh, came uh, to uh, Germany and they had the strict order uh, to confiscate all uh, German and foreign-owned art. All museums, all art collectors, all noble families had to uh, be checked whether they are uh, owners of object or if the material was during the war stolen. Nobody of the Germans could uh, give it as a gift to the Allies. It was taken by force by the Allies. 
and uh, so did the Russians. Whether the curator gave Schliemann's gold away or had it taken by force has been one of the most heated points of contention in the debate over who owns the treasure. The situation was such in Berlin at the time that everybody realized that the war was lost. And of course, there was no need to show the gun to this old scholar who was thinking about this treasure all the time. But he was in a situation where people were wounded, people were dead, and there were gun bursts and Soviet tanks all around. So he did what he did because he wanted to save the collection. Regardless of how the Russian army came into possession of the treasure, the fact remains that the Soviets quietly removed it from Berlin, even though it was in a sector of the city controlled by the British. They effectively looted everything that could be moved, and it was no surprise that, that the gold went along with it. And what is now known is that they loaded it onto a lorry and took it to an airport and flew it back to Moscow, where it was put onto another lorry, and it was taken to the Pushkin Museum. But of course, nobody knew this in the chaos after the war. So for many, many years, it was simply assumed that the gold had vanished. When Schliemann's gold and other treasures taken away from Berlin arrived in Moscow, government officials made extensive inventory lists. The treasure was then hidden away inside the Pushkin Museum. The Soviets justified the plunder as the spoils of war, paid for with the blood of the 27 million Russian soldiers and civilians who died fighting the Nazis. For several months after its arrival, Schliemann's gold was kept in the original three crates in which it was stored in Berlin. Between 1945 and 1949, the fact that the collection was here was no secret. It was an open secret. Access was open to archaeologists, specialists in antiquity, experts and party bosses. The director of the museum had the right to open the doors and show this collection to those people. Then, all of a sudden, in 1949, it was declared that the access should be closed. And so the collection was kept hidden. The Iron Curtain had fallen on the gold of Troy. The Cold War brought a dark age to the Soviet Union. The spoils of war became one of the nation's best kept secrets. Everyone was strictly instructed that this information was for official use only, confidential information. People were simply scared. And if someone asked us if we have the treasure, the official answer was always, no, we don't have it. According to law, Germany had five years to appeal to the international community for the return of its missing treasures. It never did. Experts believed that Soviet officials at the time took this as definitive evidence that Germany had given the gold freely to the Soviet Union and wanted them to keep it. But still, the treasure of Schliemann was kept in hiding. A small storage room underneath the floor of the Pushkin Museum's main entryway was the new home for the gold. Every day for the next five decades, Thousands of visitors to the Pushkin walked through the museum's doors, not knowing that one of the world's greatest treasures lay just beneath their feet. It wasn't until 1991 that the real story of looted treasures from World War II began to emerge. It was then that two art students in Moscow had stumbled upon a treasure trove of government documents detailing the spoils of war taken home by the Soviet army, including the infamous Schliemann's gold. The Russian government's first reaction was denial. The records must be wrong. 
The Russians had always maintained that Schliemann's gold was destroyed at the end of World War II. The assumption was that this gold had simply been bombed in the museum, part of which had been destroyed, and where quite a lot of the other finds of Schliemann over the years had actually perished with the museum. And it was simply assumed that the gold had gone too. I mean, nobody thought really to look for it. It had vanished. There is the ethical aspect to what happened. When I was told the collection was here, I could not see it personally. But I also was told I could not admit that the collection existed. For more than 40 years, the treasure discovered by Heinrich Schliemann in 1873 on a hillside in Turkey was hidden in a secret vault at the Pushkin Museum. The vault was in a most unlikely place. In any modern museum, there is a storage area where the access is strictly limited, and it is the same way here. There are special safes for objects like this. So in one of the safes, the collection was stored all those years, right under our feet, on the place where you are now standing. Of course, you have to remember that not many people knew that it was there, not even the Russians, because nobody thought to look. There were vague rumors that went round during the 60s and 70s about trophy brigades and people knew people who had once been part of some group of soldiers who'd packed up some treasures somewhere. Everybody knew somebody who had a friend who'd served with a trophy brigade or something. So it was sort of going around, but it was dangerous to talk about it because it was not a time when people talked about things in the Soviet Union. Even when confronted by experts in the field, people who had irrefutable evidence that the gold was somewhere in Moscow, the Russians denied its existence. Now, I went to Moscow um, to do research for this book, and, and uh, by then it was known to everybody, and they had told me about this gold. And I went and saw the Pushkin people, and I said to them, you know, and do you have Schliemann's gold in your vaults? And they said to me, with our hands on our hearts, we there is no gold here, we do not have this gold, we have never had it and, and we would know if it were here. And it was by then absolutely clear to everybody that it was there. But changes were happening in the new Russia. The old fears of the Soviet Union were being stripped away. Slowly the secrets of the past came out, even the location of Schliemann's gold. We found that documents proving that Schliemann gold is uh, in Moscow. But at the same time, Russian officials were repeating that they have no knowledge about Schliemann gold, uh, that there are no documents proving that this gold is in Moscow. And uh, only in 1993, uh, Russian officials admitted that uh, Schliemann gold is in Moscow. And uh, the whole process took um, three and a half years pressure had built up and everything had changed. Uh, that even the people at Pushkin themselves had changed. And the pressure was now on to make friends throughout Europe and to, and to come clean with some of these things. So they then said, oh, well, yes, it turns out that we have found tucked away in a vault. And by then, things had moved on and people pushed and pushed. And about a couple of months after that, they were forced to admit that by some oversights, there had indeed been a lot of gold there, which they hadn't quite been aware of. And it had been down in, tucked away in some vault. For the new generation of curators at the Pushkin, being able to open the crates containing Schliemann's gold was like a dream. As an archaeologist, I know an outstanding thing when I see it. I can't compare this feeling with anything. I can't put it into words. For example, the bowl in this collection, its finish is so different in different parts of the bowl, and it is warm to the touch, and it feels like human skin when you hold it. The Russians agreed to put the Schliemann collection on display, but they have no intention of giving it back to Germany. Their justification is that Germany still has thousands of treasures taken from the Soviet Union during the war. And the country had suffered terrible losses at the hands of the Germans. Schliemann's gold 
was nothing more than the spoils for the victor. It is an argument that brings quiet restraint from the Germans. The Trojan gold has survived and is kept uh, for research. And uh, it's more worth with the other objects kept in the museums in secrecy, especially from German soil. I am quite sure and optimistic that the Russians, uh, uh, sooner or later, uh, more sooner, will see the same thing. The new generation of colleagues will say, uh, we must return it, and it will be returned. Other countries are making claims on the gold as well. Turkey, where the treasure was first found. Greece, Schliemann's second wife was Greek, and he smuggled the gold to Athens before taking it to Berlin. Even England laid claim, saying the Berlin bunker where the treasure had been stored during the last days of the war was in a sector of the city controlled by them. But the German government is adamant. They claim rightful ownership. Schliemann had been a German citizen and had given the treasure to the Berlin Museum before he died. Regardless of the treasure's future, the gold continues to bring Schliemann the fame he so desired. His life is the subject of books and articles, and scholars continue to debate his role in modern archaeology. There's a wonderful quote about Schliemann, and that's from a classical scholar who was roughly contemporary. He said that Dr. Schliemann was essentially epoch making, a man who can state to the world a completely new problem may be content to let the final solution of it wait for those that come after him. Today, in northwest Turkey, archaeologists continue to sift through the ruins that Schliemann discovered more than a century ago. Statues, medallions, even intact structures have been unearthed, shedding additional light on the people who lived in the area before the birth of Christ. And though the discoveries have significant archaeological value, no one has ever found another treasure like Schliemann's gold. But carbon dating tests done by the Russians during the 1990s have sparked another round of controversy. Schliemann's treasure is not what he thought it was. The treasure came from a time period 1,000 years before King Priam and the era of Homer. Though Schliemann had found an ancient city that could be Troy, he failed to prove that the Homeric legends were more than just stories. It is one of the great ironies of Schliemann's gold. He found one of the world's most incredible treasures, but failed to prove his theory. At the end of the day, nobody could quite say what Schliemann had done about Troy, because he clearly hadn't absolutely found Troy. But what he had done is he had given the world a lost civilization, a prehistory which nobody had really known much about, and certainly not about its extraordinary richness and the, the, its patterns of life, um, its gold, the, the way people lived. And he opened the doors for that, and, and that is really why he remained such an important figure. The Trojan gold has become the connection with Schliemann, with Homer, and uh, yeah, the war story. It is a symbol for all the treasures of the world. A solution to where the treasure should be kept has been suggested by scholars, that a special museum be built to house the Schliemann gold. The location of the museum would be in Turkey, not far from where it was found in the land of Schliemann's beloved Troy. But so far, the Russian government has not budged. For now, the treasure will stay where it is. The fortune of Troy and the gold of Heinrich Schliemann continue to linger in an all too familiar role 
as one of the world's most famous prisoners of war.